Michael, thank you so much for joining me and uh, spending some time. What I'd really like to do is to lay down a little video here that will help our patients to understand a little bit more about what's going on in the field uh, of dementia. More specifically, I guess, in the field of Alzheimer's, one of the commonest dementias that's out there. Really with a view to, I guess, this buzz term of disease modifying. We try to avoid cure. It's a bit of a four-letter word. And I guess where I wanted to start off with is, where do we get the clues to what treatments might be effective? What is it that we're seeing, I don't know, down the microscope? What is it that we're seeing from, I don't know, genetic tests or biomarkers that give us the clues to what we might be targeting with our disease-modifying approaches? It's a very interesting question, Simon. In fact, it's probably the fact that we haven't uh, been able to rapidly find a cure that's given us a better understanding of what goes on in the brain. If we had a cure for Alzheimer's 20 or 30 years ago, or a disease modification, as you correctly call it, we may not have done all the research that we've done since. But we now know a lot more about what happens in the brain. There's three or four processes that are potentially targetable with drugs that might reduce our risk of developing or progressing with Alzheimer's and other dementias. Those processes include the build-up of at least two toxic proteins. One is called A-beta or amyloid. And the build-up of amyloid has been shown to be very deleterious to brain function. But also, related to that, there's a build-up of another protein called tau. It forms tangles in the brain. And it seems that the deterioration in memory that is experienced in people with Alzheimer's disease even more closely links to the build-up of tau. There are other proteins that build up, particularly in other forms of dementia, and they would also be targets for potential drugs. The next process that we recognise in the brain of Alzheimer's disease is inflammation. And inflammation has already been targeted in a number of trials, but unsuccessfully. But as we better understand what's going on in the brain, we have new inflammatory approaches or anti-inflammatory approaches for the uh, disease modification. There's also recognition of other processes in the brain that might also be potentially targetable. I think the biggest breakthrough is the recognition, I mentioned amyloid before, it's not the amyloid plaques that are the main cause of Alzheimer's, it's the formation of those plaques through what we call oligomers or short, fi short uh, uh, fibrils of amyloid that seem to be the most toxic. And some so of the drugs... they little bits that can build up and build up a bit like stickle bricks that stick to each other? Exactly. Or, right. and, and, and it seems to be that uh, when we've got a full uh, building of bricks, uh, the damage uh, is less. It's the bricks themselves that cause the problem. Right. And you mentioned uh, inflammation. Are there any other processes? People talk about the energy reserves in the cell or how the cell regulates itself. Are there any other key processes, particularly in Alzheimer's? Look, there may well be. There's a number of drugs that are targeting many other processes, but most of the uh, uh, eggs are in the basket of anti-amyloid and anti-tau approaches at the moment. And I think actually it's not going to be too long before we have a drug on the market, probably a drug targeting amyloid or the the uh, A-beta oligomers that I referred to, those small sections of A-beta that are going to be the first ones on the market. And are there any clues from, I guess, population studies or genetics that give us, you know, why these proteins should be there? We know that there's a group of people who get into their 90s who have relatively preserved cognition and we can actually examine their blood, look at what their lymphocytes, one of the white cells in their blood, are making and some of these people are actually making an antibody against amyloid. They're turning their accumulation of amyloid into an autoimmune disease. Now most autoimmune diseases are bad for you. Lupus is a, a bad disease, rheumatoid arthritis is a bad disease, but it seems that some people actually turn their Alzheimer's process into an autoimmune disease. And we've isolated the antibodies that these people are making and that drug called aducanumab is actually being used in a trial at the moment. The preliminary results were released in Nice about three years ago. And very encouragingly, this antibody against the amyloid is reducing the amount of amyloid in the brain of other people, not the ones who had the original autoimmune disease, but people who sadly are in the uh, processes of developing Alzheimer's. This, this drug is actually removing amyloid from their brain and improving their cognition. And this result has been replicated in another study of a similar antibody, monoclonal antibody, that was released just in Chicago in uh, July of this year, 2018. So effectively what you're saying is that those studies are there. People will be rushing out thinking, well, why don't we have the drug yet? 
Why hasn't it been released? What else is it that we need to see? Yeah, we do need to have what we call proper phase three studies, although the FDA, one of the regulatory, or the regulatory body in the United States, has recognised that sometimes we just can't afford to wait. I guess they got their fingers a bit burnt with the HIV drugs, mm -hmm. and they realised that sitting on them and doing all the due process was delaying the release of these drugs into the community. And the same is happening now with cancer drugs. They're actually now able to be uh, given to patients on the basis of the fact that the company has some data to support efficacy but is prepared to do ongoing studies even while the drug is already being used in the general population. So we may well see one of these monoclonal antibodies that remove the amyloid from the brain, perhaps particularly targeting those oligomers, the most toxic form of amyloid, but also show promise with cognition. Um, drugs, and there's actually four drugs that have now shown that, uh, monoclonal antibodies that have uh, uh, been shown to remove amyloid and improve cognition. So I think one of those four drugs will be available in the United States soon for the general population and may then therefore be accessible in other countries such as Australia. And the monoclonal antibody story, it's already in clinical practice for other diseases I think. Mm, it is. Yeah, we use monoclonal antibodies for uh, anti-cancer treatments uh, very effectively. They're also used for some other uh, inflammatory and degenerative conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and even some neurological conditions like multiple sclerosis. So there are, uh, I think they use an MS, you're the neurologist, but, <laughs> um, some of it, yeah. <laughs> but there's certainly, uh, there's certainly uh, other conditions in which monoclonal antibodies are used and uh, Alzheimer's, uh, it does seem like they have a potential benefit there. And is there any way of stratifying patients who might best respond to these targeted drugs? I mean, people talk about having blood tests or genetics or spinal fluids done. Are there any pointers that people can look at for the future about which patients might be most suitable? Yeah, so we can actually detect the build-up of the amyloid in the brain for 20 or 30 years before any, any symptoms occur. And we can pick that up uh, at the moment by doing what we call amyloid PET scans or examining their spinal fluid, but it may not be too far down the track before we can just do a blood test. And we can therefore detect people who are building up the amyloid before there's any symptoms. We call that the preclinical stage of dementia or Alzheimer's disease in particular. And therefore, those people who are in this preclinical stage would be the logical ones to be uh, treated uh, with these anti-amyloid treatments. So those blood tests aren't available, the amyloid scans aren't widely available, and the spinal fluid is obviously quite invasive. Are there any other uh, people talk about having their genes tested? Um, are there any blood tests that people should do or should they be waiting for until we know more about effective treatments? I think we'd wait for the effective treatments. Um, one of the gene tests that can be easily done to show whether you have an increased risk of late onset Alzheimer's disease is looking for what's called apolipoprotein E. It's a very easy test, but I wouldn't recommend that to the general population. And in fact, uh, uh, the, uh, the um, relevant uh, authorities, uh, the uh, professional societies, etc., have not recommended that be done as a routine test at this stage. But when we have drugs that might potentially modify the disease process, then APOE would be one test to have. If you've got E4, you are substantially uh, uh, at substantially greater risk of developing Alzheimer's and at an earlier age, particularly if you have two doses of it, because there's an E4 or there's an APOE on each of the two chromosomes that have this gene. So if you get one from mum and one from dad, Correct. that's a double hit. Correct. And is that APO gene related to the pathology that we recognise as Alzheimer's? What Ap role might it play? Yes, so apolipoprotein E moves lipids or fat around the brain right. and seems to be responsible for the formation of new synapses and getting the, the lipids where they're needed to create new synapses. The brain is basically a fatty computer and uh, it, needs, it needs ways of moving the fat around the brain because even in the 10 or 15 minutes that people have been watching this video, they have formed thousands of new synapses. That's how right. fluid, how rapid the process is going on. But to form those new synapses, we need uh, fat moved around, and apolipoprotein E is one of the transporters of such fat. Okay. And you mentioned how monoclonal antibodies might target amyloid. Are there any other approaches that are being used or developed to target amyloid protein in Alzheimer's? 
We're looking at um, uh, drugs that particularly block the binding of amyloid to cell membranes. There's a drug through a company called Cognition Therapeutics that's being tested to do that. We're also looking at um, uh, drugs that might turn off the production of amyloid. These are what are called base inhibitors. Right. Now, sadly, the recent... Base, B-A-C-E. Standing for beta amyloid cleaving enzyme. Thanks, right. right. B-A-C-E. Uh, sadly, the trials of base inhibitors across the whole spectrum, from preclinical through to mild cognitive impairment through to established Alzheimer's, uh, have so far not been very successful. But there's still a couple of trials in process and recruiting patients. And uh, let's uh, uh, hope that we'll get some success Success there. We know from uh, studies of people who have genetic mutations that affect the activity of BASE that having an underactivity of BASE uh, does reduce your risk of Alzheimer's, but of course this has been uh, the situation of these people from the time they were in utero in their mother's womb. Right, yeah. um, turning a BASE off in your 60s or 70s is a very different prospect. And we also know that there's a mutation that increases the activity of BASE and these people have an increased risk of Alzheimer's. So BASE seems a logical target, but we need the runs on the board, we need the results from trials before we offer it to the general population. I think the monoclonal antibodies against amyloid are likely to be more advanced and more soon on the market than base inhibitors. And what about the other protein at play here, the tau protein? You said that that one seems to be associated a bit more with the cell death and the actual dementing process of amyloid protein, perhaps, if you like, laying down the red carpet and then this other process starting. So are we targeting tau with any of these disease-modifying therapies? Yes, in the same way as we have monoclonal antibodies against amyloid, we have a couple of trials of monoclonal antibodies against tau. Um, the problem with tau is it largely spends its life inside the nerve cells and it's harder to get a monoclonal antibody inside. But we do know that tau propagates, it, it moves between cells and at some stage it possibly pops out of a cell before it pops into the next cell and that might be when we can target it with the monoclonal antibody. There are also other approaches to, to reduce the toxicity of tau. So tau becomes toxic only when it becomes tangled, mm -hmm. only when it has excess uh, other uh, chemicals added to it such as phosphate and there are drugs that are used to attack the phosphorylation of tau and the tangling of tau. Okay. So a lot of um, patients watching these videos will be asking themselves, how do I get involved in trials? Is there a good central resource that people should go to to be able to find out whether there are trials available that they may be able to be eligible for? So there's two issues here. One is, are they eligible? And many people would love to get into trials, but the way trials are conducted, you may not be eligible. No. Uh, you have to find out. You have to have your memory in the right sort of range. You generally have to be proven to have the disease. So you might have to have some form of amyloid test or tau test. Um, you'd also need to uh, uh, have a partner, a study partner. So there are a number of criterias that are needed before you can get into a trial. But we're doing far better at recruiting people into trials. And it's now moving from almost the exception to the norm for people to think about trials. Now, where do you find out about what trials are, carrying, uh, are being carried out? Um, the AC4R, num uh, capital A, capital C, number four, capital R, which you can Google, have a list of current trials around Australia. Um, there's also a list of current trials in the uh, Dementia Australia website. Um, and if you have any trouble though, if you go to most hospitals, they'll have a clinical trials uh, uh, part of their uh, web page that will tell you what trials are being carried out. Or alternatively, they can email you, Simon. Email us, go through the website, there's no problem. And, and their own specialists, of course. I mean, mm. we, we always want to make sure that people are going through their own GP and specialists so that everyone's on board at the same mm. point in time. Mm. So I guess the message here is this whole hype versus hope. But what I think you're telling us is that we're entering a period where hope might be rising and hype might be coming down. Well, look, we need hope. With the number of people with Alzheimer's and the project projections for the future, 150 million people around the world by 2050, we certainly need hope. And yes, I believe we now actually are at a stage where that hope is well-founded. We have hope for prevention, but we also now have hope for disease modification. In other words, treatment. And that hope is going to be, I think, vested uh, in these new drugs, but used at the right dose and generally at the earlier enough stage. By the time we're well established in the dementia process, we may be not able to benefit from these drugs. So we need to get people in the very earliest stages.
Michael, it's been an absolute delight spending some time with you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. My pleasure, Simon. Fabulous, thank you.